Matthew chapter 5, you'd go with me. I know for some of you that are just here today, you may not realize we've been preaching through the book of Matthew and on this journey with Jesus as we find Matthew chapter 5 verse 27 is where we've come to this morning and uh, we dealt with last week verses 21 to 26 and we're just working our way through the book. But uh, we saw, saw last week we dealt with the unseen, the heart. And um, which really where, is where our Christian life is lived, you know. What shows up on the outside is a result of what's on the inside. And uh, that's where the Lord Jesus is different than religion. Uh, see, religion is just something changing on the outside, but the Lord Jesus says, I want to make you new on the inside. I want to give you a new nature. We were born from above. As Jesus used the term, you must be born again. And if you don't know the Lord as your Savior today, that would be my prayer for you, that you'd come to know Him. And uh, then, now once he changes you on the inside, now you can live the Christian life and bring honor and glory to our Father, uh, the Lord. And so that's our desire. It's all about what we yield to, really, to his spirit or to our flesh. M Matthew chapter 15, we won't go there. We're at Matthew 5, but let me read to you verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart, Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, and blasphemies. And so it it's all has to do with our heart. That's where it begins. We all know that's true. Uh, and when the Bible talks about our heart, we know it's not this blood-pumping organ. It's the seat of our decision. It's the inner man. Uh, our mind as well, you could call it. But God doesn't give a person a new body when you get saved. <laughs> I wish he did. Some of you wish that. We will have a new body one day. We're looking forward to that. But he does give us a new nature the moment we're saved. The Bible says, uh, what? No, you're not. That your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. He comes in, and when he does, all things become new. And we have a new nature now within us, uh, the Spirit of God. And God alters that mainspring. He puts love in the place where all we knew was lust. That's where we come to in Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his, notice, heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And I want to bring you the title of the message this morning, The Exceeding Sinfulness of Sin. May the Lord help us. Let's pray together. Father, would you teach us from your word now? We yield to your Holy Spirit to have his way in our lives. May every heart be yielded to you now. May the lost be saved. Those that know you come to know you in a greater way today. And we'll thank you for it. Open our eyes, we pray, to behold wondrous things out of thy law. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You look at, listen to our Lord's words here. You see the exposure of the terribleness of sin. To the point, he says, pluck out your eye. Cut off your right hand. This is serious what he's speaking about. You know, what is lust? What is lust? Well, lust is the impatient desire that says, it's the feeling that says, I have to have it now. I must have it at once. Uh, let me start with the illustration. Most of the time I end with that. But if you hold your place here and go to Genesis with me, the Bible gives us two brothers and a beautiful picture of love and lust. Would you look in the beginning? Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25. Now remember in the Bible... In the context of Matthew 5, we understand lust is talking about in the nature uh, that is sensual. But in the Bible, lust doesn't always mean it's a want. It means a desire. We find in Genesis 25 the story of Esau. Esau's been out hunting. He's hungry. And he wants a bowl of his brother's soup or stew. or The Bible calls it pottage here in verse 25. Or 29 of Genesis 25, the Bible says, And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I'm faint. 
Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright <laughs> for a bowl of soup. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So here Esau sells his birthright, which if you don't know much about it, I'm not going to give all the history, but that was the most important thing you could have in the Old Testament in the family to be the one that had the birthright, the oldest, and, and uh, the financial, what that was worth to be the oldest, to lead the family after dad dies and so on. I mean, and he sold it for a bowl of soup. See, lust says, I have to have it now. I've got to satisfy this now. All right, so there's a picture of lust. Now look at Genesis 29, would you? Just a couple pages over. Jacob here is in love. <laughs> he wants to marry Rachel. And the Bible says here in Genesis 29, verse 15, and all the young people here will be happy we don't continue this type of thing. And Laban said unto Jacob, because thou art my brother, this is Genesis 29, 15, thou, uh, because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored, and Jacob loved Rachel and, I, and said, I'll serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Laban said, it's better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him, you can hear the love story tone, right? But a few days for the love he had to her. Here's a young man in love. And seven years, that's a long time. But he said, just like a few days, because he was so in love with her. See, love can wait seven years, but lust can't wait two seconds. Seven years. And we have in these elementary schools, God help us, intermediate schools, junior high, where young people, if you love me, you'll do these type of acts with me. Well, that's not love at all. The Bible says he loved her, he waited seven years. And see, love is wanting what's best for that person, not what you want. That's lust, see. Love can wait seven years. See, we all, and especially young people here today, need to realize, whenever our God says no, he says no because he wants to have a greater yes later. I'm so thankful for God helping me to stay pure and say no until God gave me my wonderful wife and the three children we have and the family together. But a no that God gives is always because he wants what's best. He wants to say a greater yes. Like when your parents say no cookies right before dinner because they want you to enjoy the steak and potatoes because that's good for you, right? There's a greater yes. When you get older, you'll like the steak and potatoes better, right? Then you can have the cookie after. Hallelujah. But remember last week, the Pharisees and scribes had reduced the commandments of God to the mere physical act. And God's trying to help them understand that the Bible is not talking about Thou shalt not commit murder. Just don't kill somebody. It's talking about more than that. What's the attitude of murder? It's anger. And he dealt with that in the verses last week, 21 to 26, back in Matthew 5 now. And here they had reduced this commandment of thou shalt not commit adultery just to the very act. And as long as they didn't commit the physical act of adultery, they were perfectly innocent as far as that law goes. But Jesus said that's not it at all. Again, they only considered the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. They had forgotten the whole spirit of the law. If you go to Exodus 20, we won't turn there for sake of time, but the Bible does say, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you would just read the rest of the Ten Commandments, you'd come down to chapter Exodus 20, verse 17. He says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So we understand, obviously, in the Ten Commandments, God deals with the heart. You don't covet in an act on the outside. Coveting is in the heart. A desire something else for something someone else has that God hasn't given you. If they had truly studied and considered them, they would have realized they were guilty like Paul finally realized. Remember, Paul said, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, I had kept the law blamelessly. Well, we know that's not true. We're all sinners. But they had so reduced the commandments to simply just the physical act of these things rather than what Jesus always dealt with, what God dealt with, the heart. 
We dealt with that last week. I'm not going to re-preach my message from last week. But Romans 7, Paul finally got it. Listen to Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Romans 7, 7. See, the law had always, always stressed the importance of the heart. But they had become completely mechanical in their worship. You, we can get that way. They had become completely mechanical in the worship of God. As long as I do this, this, and this. I was at church. I dressed nice. I sang. I sat. I stood. I, I listened. I slept with my eyes open or whatever. Right? As long as I was in the place, I've completed my duty. But you can sit in church and not worship. You can sit in church and have sin in your heart. God cannot hear your prayer, and you cannot commune with the Lord because of that sin. And so that's where they were. But Jesus, he went behind all the outward sin. It's deeper than just the outward, which we can, remember we talked about the actual things that you can just see with your senses physically. He went to the real, uh, that which is behind that, the heart. That's the source of sin, see, the heart. That's what Jesus said, I already gave you in Matthew 15, 18, 19. See, there would be no adultery. No fornication, no whoredom or whoremongers. And many times, no divorce. He's going to deal with that in verse 31 and 32. But there'd be no uncleanness of any kind without that lustful look. And Jesus said, look, you've just said that all the commandments says don't commit the act. But I want to tell you, he that looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. Let's well, see three things about the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Number one, the Savior from sin. We'll start with the good, the Savior. Would you turn with me to Isaiah 53? I, look, you think, boy, sin's bad, and it is, but we have a Savior, friends. Thank God for that. God wants us to see our sin because we don't see Him. See our sin, we'll never need a Savior. Oh, why do I need a Savior if I'm already good? You know, I'm pretty good. No, I'm a sinner, see? I need a Savior. Isaiah 53, would you look at it with me? Verse 1. Here's the prophecy of what was coming, that Jesus would come. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Amen. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid, should have been on me, but on him, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. We have a wonderful Savior. What a Savior that took all that for us. Keep reading, look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. See, God's holiness and righteousness had to be satisfied. It had to be pleased. It, you could not just sweep sin under the rug. It, the penalty must be paid, because God is holy, and God is righteous. And Jesus said, I'll take the penalty. I'll pay for their sin. And the Bible says, he saw the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many. We're part of that. For he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Friend, unless we're clear about the doctrine of sin, we'll never understand the New Testament way of salvation. Look at our Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he die on the cross? The Bible says his face was set as a flint to go to Jerusalem. Why did he set his face as a flint 
steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, knowing he would go there to die? Why did he refuse to allow his followers to fight for him? Why did he say that if he desired, I could command 12 legions of angels to come down? And, but he would not. They could have protected him. But he said if he did, he would not be able to fulfill all righteousness. What is the meaning of the death on the cross? See, if we don't understand the doctrine of sin, we'll never really know the answers to these questions. The only way to understand the New Testament doctrine of salvation is to start with the doctrine of sin. Whatever else sin may be, it is, it is at least something that could be dealt with only by the shedding of the blood of our precious Savior on the cross of Calvary. He had to actually go to the death of the cross. That had to happen. There was no other way, no other hope for us. God, I say with this, with reverence, would never allow His only begotten Son to be to suffer, to be brutally killed, to suffer the agony of the uncleanness and filth of all the world, of all of our sin on him, unless it was absolutely necessary. And it was necessary because of our sin. So we have to start with the Savior and the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the demands of the law, the punishment meted out by the law, and the eternal consequences of evil and wrongdoing. We have to start there. Then we can see how great salvation we have. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great pastor at Westminster Chapel in London, back in 1960, said this, Far too often there have been people who have been smug and glibly satisfied with themselves because they're not guilty of certain things, adultery, for example, and therefore think that they are all right, but they have never examined their heart. Self-satisfaction Smugness and glibness are the very antithesis of the New Testament doctrine of holiness. Here we see holiness as a matter of the heart and not merely a matter of conduct. It is not only man's deeds that count, but his desires. Not only must we not commit, we must not covet. It penetrates to the very depths. And thus this conception of holiness leads to constant watchfulness and self-examination. Watch ye, says the Apostle Paul, the Corinthians, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Search your own heart and discover whether there be any evil there. That is the New Testament holiness. End of quote. Look, above all, the doctrine of sin leads us to see the absolute need of a power greater than ourselves to deliver us. It makes a man run to Christ, see. It makes a man say, I need a Savior. See, without him, I can do nothing. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes brought us to that, didn't it? Without Jesus, I can't do anything. That's what poor in spirit is. The humbleness of recognizing what I am. Without him, I can do nothing. Our Lord's words in Matthew 5 were an indication of how deep his feelings were about moral purity and protecting the home. To preach this doctrine of sin is to reveal man to himself. See? <laughs> Remember, before salvation, we cannot see. We're spiritually blind. Jesus would say, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We can't see. And so to understand the doctrine of sin, to preach it to a man or woman, helps them to see himself or herself as they are. And when you see yourself for what you really are, you'll abhor yourself. You'll become poor in spirit, poverty of spirit, humble before God. You find in the Bible, whenever God showed up, people fell flat on their face, unworthy. I'm a sinful man. Isaiah, you're a prophet. I'm unworthy. Peter said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. When he recognized Jesus, see, we'll become poor in spirit. We'll become meek. We'll mourn over our sin. We'll hunger and thirst after righteousness. We'll run to Christ. We'll abide in him. It's not an experience to be received so much as a life to be lived. A Christ to be followed, see. Look at the cross. Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer, had it right. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gains I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. Save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, 
sorrow and love flow mingled down? Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown, were the whole realm of nature mine? That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. When I survey the wondrous cross, now we begin to see something about the real cost, the power of sin. Thank God for the Savior from sin. Secondly, I want you to notice the strength of sin. The strength of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57 says, The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, sin is something, and I say this with reverence, but it create, sin is something that created a problem even in heaven. The devil lifted up in pride before he was the devil as Lucifer, the angel, see. Profound a problem like that caused a problem in heaven. Sin is what caused the Savior to sweat great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sin is what caused him to suffer the agony of the sin of all the world on the cross of Calvary and die on the cross. See, that's sin. We can never consider that too frequently, what our sin cost, what it cost. We think of the strength of sin. Think of the depth, the power of sin. See, sin is not only a matter of action and of deeds. It's something within the heart that leads to the action. In other words, the teaching here is the characteristic teaching of the Bible everywhere about the subject through the Scriptures, namely that we must realize and concentrate on what the problem is, is not so much sins, but sin. See, sins are the symptom of the disease that we all have called sin. See, it's a disease that kills. Symptoms don't kill. Uh, symptoms just show in evidence there's a problem. And symptoms can vary. Go with me to a hospital and see someone you think, well, they'll be out tomorrow. <laughs> they're looking good today, and they're dead before tomorrow. You think, what? They look so good. Symptoms can vary. You can look at someone and think, my goodness, they don't have much to live. They'll be gone in the week, and they live several more years. Uh, you, you can't always tell because, see, the disease does not show up on the outside. It, there's symptoms. The symptoms can vary. We all have this disease. Notice verse 27, 28 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. See, this is the truth with our Lord here impresses upon us. The fact that you've not committed the act of adultery does not mean that you're clear from that. That you're guiltless. What about your heart? That's what he's saying. Is there disease there? Now sin must be understood like this as a terrible power. It's not so much that I do a thing, it's what makes me do it. What urges me to do this? That's what really matters. That's the root. See, Verse 29 and 30, look at what he says. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profit for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. I mean, think of the severe tones he's speaking with. We'll explain this in a little bit. He says, and cast it from thee, for it is profit for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Think how Jesus views the power of sin. See, we all know the importance of the right hand. <laughs> Forgive me, lefties, right? But it's a right-handed world mostly, right? Uh, the importance of the right eye. I mean, how much do you sell your right eye for, your right hand? I mean, we know the importance of it. And God says here, if the most precious thing you have, in a sense, is the cause of sin, get rid of it. <laughs> Shunning sin is, is, it, is as important as that in your life. There are many things in the life and world which in and of themselves are good. They're right. They're profitable. For instance, Luke 14, 26, listen to Jesus. If any man come to me and hate not his father, what? Hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What is he saying? Our Lord's saying those things that trap us, even if they're good things, if they trap us, we must choose Christ over those things, 
even over ourselves, even over our family. That does not mean we ought to hate our family. God commands us to love our family. He says if we don't provide for our family, we're worse than an infidel, right? Obviously, that's not what he means. He even told us to love our enemies, right? But it's our misuse of these things that he's dealing with. See, anything that comes between me and God is now idolatry. The Bible says that idolatry is as the sin of witchcraft. Nothing can take God's place, and when it does, it becomes an idol. And we're saying, you're not God, I choose, not you. Now, if he's Lord, that means master, then he's God, he's over. It becomes idolatry, see. Never ceases to amaze me that a man's children or grandchildren would be coming to town for his birthday, and so they miss church. You think, I thought Christ is supposed to be first in our life. Well, what about saying one of the things I want for my birthday is all my kids and grandchildren to be with me in church. I mean, what a testimony. Is church really, is God really that big to you or not? Well, I'll just miss it. See, that's what Jesus was referring to. When it comes between a choice between the two, we'll choose obedience to Christ over everything. Jesus is saying that however valuable the thing, your hand, your eye, no matter how valuable it is in and of itself, if it's going to trap you and cause you to stumble, get rid of it. Throw it away. I remind you again, it's not merely a question of not committing certain acts. It's a question of dealing with the pollution of the sin in your heart. Do we realize that the most important thing we're doing in this life is preparing for eternity? Do we recognize that? The devil has all times of bright lights. He's shaking all over the place and don't oh, look over here what you can do and look other but God says this is all to be a preparation for eternity to come yeah. that's what this life is about see we are to live a full life yes but only as those that are preparing themselves for the next life for eternity for the glory that awaits he says there Ye have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I send to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Oswald Chambers, the writer of My Utmost for His Highest, said this, Jesus Christ spoke rugged truth. He was never ambiguous. And he says it better to be, it's better to be maimed than damned. Better to live your life lame in people's sight and lovely in God's than to be lovely in human eyes and lame in God's. In these verses, Jesus described a maimed life to begin with. We may look all right in the sight of other people, but we are remarkably twisted and wrong in the sight of God. One of our Lord's principles that we are slow to grasp is this. The only basis of the spiritual is the sacrifice of the natural. The natural life is neither moral nor immoral. I make it moral or immoral by my ruling disposition or the nature. Jesus teaches that the natural life is meant for sacrifice. We can give it as a gift to God, which is only to make it spiritual. It's the only way. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That is where Adam failed. Adam and Eve. He refused to sacrifice the natural life and make it spiritual by obeying God's voice. In that he sinned. The sin was claiming right to himself. Why did God demand that I sacrifice the natural to the spiritual? He didn't. God's order was that the natural should be transformed into the spiritual by obedience. It was sin that made it necessary for the natural to be sacrificed, which is a very different thing. If you're going to be spiritual, you must trade away the natural, sacrifice it. But if you say, ah, I don't want to sacrifice the natural for the spiritual, then Jesus says you must trade away the spiritual. That is not a punishment, but an eternal principle. This discipline is the harshest imposed on humanity. There's nothing more heroic, more grand than the Christian life. Spirituality is not a sweet tendency toward goodness in people who are afraid to be bad. Spirituality is the possession of the life of God, which is masculine in its strength. He will make the most corrupt, twisted, sin-stained life entirely spiritual if he is obeyed. 
Purity is strong and fierce, and the person who is going to be pure for Jesus Christ's sake has a glorious, excellent job ahead. When Jesus Christ has altered our disposition, we have to bring our body into harmony with the new disposition. We must cause our body to exercise a new disposition, and this can only be done by stern discipline, which will mean cutting off a great many things for the sake of our spiritual life. I know it's a long reading if you'll just listen with your heart. Some things are like a right hand and eye to us, yet we don't dare use them. The world around us says, how absurd. Why would you cut that off? What is wrong with a right hand? They'll call us fanatics and cranks. If you've never been a crank or a fanatic, it's a pretty sure sign that you've never begun to take life seriously. In the beginning, the Holy Spirit will keep us from doing many things that may be perfectly right for everyone else, but they'll not be right for us. Jesus says, to further our spiritual character, we must be prepared to be limited fools in the sight of others. If we're only willing to give up wrong things for Jesus Christ, we should never talk about being in love with him. If you want to say, why shouldn't I? There's no harm in it. Go and do it. But remember that the construction of spiritual character is doomed as soon as you take that line. If he or she knows how any person will, if she or he or she knows how, any person will give up their own things. But are we prepared to give the best we have for Jesus Christ? The only right we have as a Christian is the right to give up our rights. That's pretty strong. But see, the Christian life is not a list that we check off. The Christian life is walking moment by moment with Christ. We're on a journey with Jesus. He's a person. The Holy Spirit of God has come to live within you. And now we're not to walk by the flesh or by sight, but walk by the Spirit of God, which is in us. And we know Him through His Word. We are also very concerned about this life, but are we equally concerned about our soul? Our spiritual destiny. Put your soul in eternal destiny before everything else. It may mean that you'll not get that promotion at work. Or that you'll not do as well as somebody else. Well, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? See, that's the calculation. There is in all of us, we must face it, the depth and the power of sin. The strength of sin. Thirdly, lastly, not only the Savior from sin, the strength of sin, but the subtlety of sin. The subtlety of sin. See, sin is a terrible thing which so deludes and fools us to make us feel quite happy and contented so long as we've not committed the act. Yeah, I was tempted, you know, but thank God I did not fall. Well, that's all right to a point, so as long as you're not content with that. I ought to ask, but why did I want to do it? Why did I want to do it? Why was I tempted to even do that? See, that's where the subtlety of sin comes in. It affects the whole constitution of man. Think of the clever way, really the awful way that sin creeps in and that we are guilty of sinning in the mind. You know, there are highly respectable men and women that would never dream of committing the act of adultery. Never dream of it. But look at the way in which they enjoy sinning in the mind, in the imagination. You take it from Harlequin romance books all the way to graphic pornography. See, you're sinning in your heart. You're sinning in your mind and your imagination. And you, therefore, are guilty of adultery. That's what Christ says. Now, I know the consequences are not equivalent. Okay? You can't get some type of STD or something like that. We understand that from the imagination. But God says, as far as your relationship with God, if that's important to you, he says you've committed adultery. How subtle this awful, terrible thing is. Remember Amnon? His wicked sin, it was one of David's son. Amnon had a half-sister who looked upon and lusted upon. His friend encouraged him, act like you're sick and ask your dad to have her come in and make food for you and then when you have her alone, you can have her. And that's exactly what he did. Raped her. The Bible says after he was through, his hate was greater than the love he had for. Her. It's because it wasn't love. Some great love. It was lust. But see, it was already done in his heart long before he ever completed the act. 
See, the moment David, his father, had looked over the balcony and saw Bathsheba bathing herself and sent his men to go get her for him, the act had not been done, but the sin had already happened in his heart. See? And that's what God's trying to help us see. There's a perverting nature and effect of sin. How true. That is what sin does. It perverts us. It's such a devastating, perverting thing that it turns the very instruments of God that he's given us that were meant to minister to my good, my right hand, my right eye, now it becomes my enemy. He says, if it is your enemy, cut it off. God-given, excellent gifts, the very desires that God gave us that allows us to marry and have children and that type of thing can become our enemies. Why? Because sin twists everything. See? It's beautiful in marriage. It's an abomination outside of marriage, God says. Read Romans 7 carefully. You'll see that for yourself. Sin twists everything. Twists you up in knots. Sin is destructive. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote that it, that it is the biblical, the New Testament doctrine of sin. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Of course not. But is it in our hearts? Is it in our imagination? Do we like it? God forbid that any of us should be able to look at this holy law of God and feel satisfied. If we do not feel unclean at this moment, God have mercy upon us. If we, have conceivably be, if we can be conceivably be satisfied with our lives because we've never committed an act of adultery or of murder or any one of these things, I say that we do not know ourselves nor the blackness and the foulness of our own hearts. We must listen to the teaching of the blessed Son of God and examine ourselves, examine our thoughts, our desires, our imagination. And unless we feel that we are vile and foul and need to be washed and cleansed, unless we feel utterly helpless with a terrible poverty of spirit, unless we are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, I say, God, have mercy upon us. I thank God that I have a gospel which tells me that another who is spotless and pure and utterly holy has taken my sin and my guilt upon himself. I am washed in his precious blood. He has given me his own nature. When I realized that I needed a new heart, I found, thank God, that he had come to give it me, and he has given it. And to quote, hallelujah. See, there are many in the early days of Christianity that literally cut off the right hand. They literally plucked out the right eye. But that wasn't what the Lord was talking about. You don't think with your right hand or right eye. They could still see with their left eye. and They still had a left hand. And so they still sin. See, God wasn't talking about literally. Obviously, our Lord is not talking about literal surgery, for that wouldn't solve the problem at all. It's a matter of the heart, see. But deal immediately and decisively with it. Don't taper off. Cut it off. See, he says, cut it off. Spiritual surgery is more important than physical surgery. Listen to these verses, would you? Romans 8, 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body, bringing into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means to put to death. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify through the spirit the deeds of the body, he says. And our Lord says, if I, if I right hand offend thee, cut it off. See, it's the same principle everywhere. Well, what does it mean? Well, first it means we must not feed the flesh. There's a fire within you. There's a beast within you, and if you feed it, if you ever bring any oil or gas near that flame, it'll begin to burn. There's going to be trouble. So that old man is still inside you. God's given us a new nature, but your flesh is capable of anything you read about in the paper and think, how in the world your flesh is capable of that? Verse 20, 27, 28, would you see it again? Matthew 5, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now I want to say this, men, you are responsible. If you have to run like Joseph, if you have to look up only or look down, 
or get out, get out. And by the way, in our day, it's not just men that have a problem with lust. There's women that have that problem as well. But I will say that the other party, whoever's being looked upon, there is some responsibility that they are to make sure the way they are presenting themselves to not be a stumbling block. Notice what it says in verse 28. Whosoever looketh, looketh. Now we are all aware there are certain ways a person can dress that draws attention to the body. Right? We're all aware of that. There are ways people can dress that draw attention to the sexual zones of the body. And God says here, whosoever looketh on a woman. Now I know that neither you or I want to be a stumbling block to somebody. And uh, that's why I've dressed covered up so today. <laughs> but it's very possible to become a stumbling block. It happens even among Christians outside the church house as well as inside the church house at times. Listen to Isaiah 57, 14. God says, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Romans 14, 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Don't do it. Can I give you three practical principles when it comes to dress standards? Now, I know you have dress standards. All of us do. Because <laughs> you're dressed today. Hallelujah. You're wearing clothes. And all of us would say there are things I wouldn't wear. Now, that's not right. That's not decent. I wouldn't wear that. All of us. Now, that may be different for some than others, but all of us have some line that we'd say, I wouldn't wear that. That's not decent. So we all have dress standards. What does the Bible say about it? May I? Seriously, may I give you three principles from God's Word? I understand a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. But would you hear the Lord, what the Bible says? Now, don't forget he's the Savior from sin. Don't forget what he's done. You read Isaiah 53. Nothing's too much for you, Lord, whatever you'd want. Nothing. All he did for us. But this is what the Bible says. Can I share it this morning? Would you ask the Lord to teach us what he would have us to see? You'll see it fits right with the message. And we'll come to Matthew 5. I'll give you three principles on God's dress standard, if you will. Deuteronomy 22. Would you look there with me? We're going to turn to two places, then we'll end up back in Matthew 5. Deuteronomy 22. The Bible says there, Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Let me just give you three principles from the Word of God. Deuteronomy 22, 5 says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are, what's the next word? Abomination unto the Lord thy God. So first principle is, there's a difference in dress between men and women. Now, I'm not going to argue with you about what that is, but the principle is very clear from the Bible. There is a difference, God says, between, in dress between men and women. All right? Do you understand we are in a shifting culture that is colliding with God's unchanging word? It's shifting, changing constantly, but God's word doesn't change. And so it keeps colliding with God's word. And Christians many times are caught in that because of the culture that's changing around them. Look, if something was wrong, I mean was sin, a hundred years ago, is it still wrong today? See, if it was ever wrong, it's still wrong. Otherwise, it wasn't wrong then. If it was ever wrong, it's still wrong. If it was ever right, it's still right. Because God does not change, nor does his word. This is important. Look, you say, well, I don't care about it. I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, then that, that's fine. If you want to please the Lord, that's who I'm talking to today. That's all. Look, he died for me. I want to please him in every area of my life. Now, what you wear is not the most important thing. I think in three years I've been the pastor, I've never even dealt with this subject. So, please, if you're first time today, don't think this is where we're at all the time. Because the heart is way more important as I've already preached. You've got to get the heart right first. You've got to come to know Christ first. Then God begins to work on the inside, but eventually he does get to the outside. Because it is all important, because we represent the King of Kings. I guarantee if you represent the President of the United States, he's going to have a say of what you wear. 
I mean, it's just the way it's going to be. If I represent God, I'm his ambassador, then it does matter. It does matter how I present myself. So, again, take it in that spirit. 1 Timothy 2, would you look there? See, God and his word never changes. 1 Timothy chapter 2. So that was an Old Testament one. Let's look at a New Testament. 1 Timothy in chapter 2. Look at this principle here. See, the Holy Spirit of God's inside you. He'll lead you. I'm not going to hold up any article of clothing and say this is that and that is this. I'm just trying to help us to see some principles that was obvious from God's word. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 9 and 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So I want you to notice in verse 9 and 10, the two phrases he gives about modest apparel, and that in verse 10, which becometh women professing godliness. We could all talk today and say, all right, a certain person will dress this way. Right? They work at a certain company, they dress this way. The Bible says in Proverbs, he says, there met a young man, a woman, in the attire of a harlot. So there, we all can understand that. There are certain things that are one way and some things that are other way. Well, here the Bible says that this is how godly. So I don't care about that. Well, God says if you do care about being godly, if you are interested in being a woman that professes godliness, he says in modest apparel. Now here's the principle. This is for everybody, men and women. God expects modesty. Okay? God expects modesty. So there's a difference in dress between men and women, but God, second principle, God expects modesty. It is a serious thing. It is. Modesty is important to the Lord for lots of reasons. One, I've been talking to even someone this week, talking about their niece and nieces, and just uh, you're giving an example for the next generation. Their children are seeing them dress a certain way, and it's, it's grieving her heart. Let me just read what Webster's Dictionary said. This is a current definition. It's pretty good. This is the definition of modesty Webster gives. Gives. We know God expects modesty. We just read it. Modesty is the quality of dressing in ways that do not attract sexual attention. It's pretty good. Modesty is the quality of dressing in ways that do not attract sexual attention. Now, the world knows there's a certain way you can dress to attract it. Okay? They know how to do that. If you turn on a football game this afternoon, I'm not advising it, but you can find the cheerleaders, they know how to dress a certain way to attract, right, that type of attention. But modesty is not doing that. Matthew chapter 5, here's the last principle. Okay, right back where we started, Matthew chapter 5. First principle, there's a difference in dress between men and women, Deuteronomy 22, 5. Secondly, God expects modesty, 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. And then the last principle is right here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, 28, where we've been. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And here's the third principle. Men are affected by sight. Now women can too, but not in the same way. And God clearly gives it in this way. Now this is Jesus talking. You can argue with me, but you can, this is what the Lord said. That men are affected by sight. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now this does not excuse the person looking. Look, you could dress the most modest type thing and a, a woman or a man could lust after somebody. A perverted heart to them, nothing's pure, the Bible says. But there are things that people do dress in that causes thoughts to enter the mind. Okay, we understand that. So I'm not removing the, the I do not excuse and I'm not excusing the person looking. Not at all. But, don't forget the stumbling block principle. Remember Romans 14, 13, I read it earlier, let us therefore, not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, I'm not taking David's blame away, but maybe if Bathsheba hadn't been bathing where he could see her, he hadn't fallen to sin. Now, David's guilty, and God held David guilty. 
So I'm not taking that away. But boy, I'd sure like to have prevented that, wouldn't you? To read the story of David in the Bible. God, this man, the man after God's own heart, she could have helped him. God says it's so serious. As we think of this principle, as men are affected by sight, the next verse says, and if I ride out, and they pluck it out. <laughs> so, be aware of clothing being too revealing, too low, too high, too tight. Would you ask the Holy Spirit? God says, trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he should direct thy path. So would you be willing to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, are you pleased with what I'm wearing? Are you pleased with this outfit or this? Hey, if you'll do that, wouldn't that be wonderful? That's for every area of our life. This is just, this is where we've come to as we're preaching through God's word here, aren't we? This is where we came to in our study. As we conclude this morning, yes, there is strength of sin. And there is a subtlety of sin. But keep your eyes on the Savior from sin. <laughs> Don't ever forget the great truth of the price that had to be paid to deliver you from the Savior, by the Savior from our sin. And nothing's too much to do for him. Nothing. Or allow him. Nothing's too much to allow him to speak into our life, to change, to add, subtract. Not if we consider the price he paid. He died for you. See, the cross. He became sin for us. See, to the Christian, there's no greater stimulus or incentive to fight, to mortify the deeds of the body than this. You know how often the scripture reminds us that his object for coming to the world was to seek and to save that which was lost. Why? Why would he love us? Why did he want us? To deliver us from this present evil world? To redeem us from all iniquity? To separate unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works? See, it was all designed in order that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. If his love and his sufferings mean anything to us, and it'll, it'll inevitably lead us to agree with Isaac Watts when I survey the wondrous cross. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Friend, we need the Holy Spirit moment by moment. I need him moment by moment. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you. He is working in you, the Bible says, both to will and to do of his good pleasure please him. If we'll recognize the exceeding sinfulness of sin and if we're concerned about this purification and we will start with a process of mortification, putting to death the old nature, my way, my will, and allow him to have his way, he'll empower us. That's a promise. Oh, may we, may we yield to him today. Let's bow and pray.